back in the UK, when um, I talk to people outside the finance sector about finance, the question is, which is often posed in one way or another is what all the people who work in the City of London actually do. What is going on in these office blocks where the lights are on late into the night? And the answer, to an extent that almost defies belief, is that what they do is they trade with each other. To give um, some examples, uh, global trade in goods and services has expanded a lot in the last 50 years. But global trade in foreign exchange is 100 times the total volume of underlying global trade in goods and services. A lot of people still think that what banks do is they take deposits from savers and they lend them out to business. And if I explain that if I look at the assets of British banks, less than 3% of them are actually loans to non-financial businesses. They're quite surprised. In fact, a lot of people in the banking sector are quite surprised to learn that as well. So we have a world of finance today in which people trade with each other, talk to each other, use their own language, uh, and uh, judge each other by criteria which they have themselves generated. And if one goes on to talk about this to this non-financial audience, people ask the question, so what is it all for? In what way is this relevant to the, the non-financial economy? And that's a pretty good question. Now, it's easy to make this sound a tirade against finance, and it can't be a tirade against finance, because we all need finance. And we have no prosperous societies that don't have an active financial sector. And the rise of modern industrialization was very much associated with the growth of financial sector and financial instruments. We need a financial sector in order to uh, enable us to make payments. We need it in order to receive wages and salaries, to pay our bills, uh, businesses need it to enable them to trade and settle debts with each other. And that's the core utility of finance, which is actually what most people in finance actually do. Most people who work in finance are not masters of the universe paid telephone number salaries. They're fairly ordinary people doing mundane clerical jobs for fairly modest salaries. We need a finance sector to help us manage our wealth over our lifetime, to finance education when we're young, retirement when we're old, to enable us to pass wealth on to succeeding generations. We need a finance sector to help with risk management, and we need a finance sector to help with capital allocation. And it's the capital allocation side of things I want to talk about mainly today. And it's appropriate to talk about this to this group mainly today, because if I look at what the capital stock of a, a modern economy like Britain or the United States or Australia, New Zealand is, then that capital stock is predominantly housing. In Britain and New Zealand, residential property accounts for about 60% of the total value of physical assets in the country. And the balance of physical assets divides over the world roughly equally between non-residential property, between infrastructure assets, and between other business investment. So that construction and buildings taken together account for 70% or a little more of the capital stock everywhere. And therefore the main function of capital allocation in a modern economy is to enable that stock to be replenished and renewed, to provide funding for that, and to enable for, uh, that, that capital stock to be maintained, funded, and supported. Capital allocation, then, is mainly about property. If I look at uh, personal wealth, that's also mostly housing. It's a bit less than that 60% plus because people have mortgages against it. But typically we find that about 
of total personal wealth uh, today is in the form of people's equity in their houses. Now, that's been the, the, the significance of housing, the total has been growing, uh, but it's been true for some time that housing has been the dominant element in the, in the total. But that was absorbed in a big change that happened in the nature of the financial sector from the 1970s through 1980s. The change which led to the kind of world which I described at the beginning, a change which most pe many people have called financialization, essentially in which the financial sector grew in size, grew in remuneration, and came to take on a central role in the economy much larger than it actually had before. And that happened in the 1980s, really in the relation to the housing and construction sector. That typically the financing for that, the larger part of it was done by a local bank or building society or similar managers providing finance uh, both, uh, both for new construction and for existing construction. But in the 1980s, what happened was housing finance and construction finance became part of the process of financialization and securitization. At uh, Solomon Brothers, a trader called Lou Ranieri proclaimed that mortgages are math. And what he meant by that was that he would take packages of mortgages, securitize them, and sell them on. So that from the 1980s, there grew on a very large scale this market in securitized products based on, on mortgages or on other types of bank loans. So lending to this sector became part of this overall process of financialization in which trading in financial assets based on existing physical assets became the central activity of the modern financial sector. Now, one important consequence of that uh, was that it became less important what the quality of the underlying loan was than whether you could actually sell that loan on to somebody else. Now, these things aren't, of course, completely unrelated, but they're not the same thing either. So that the constant demand for these kind of products led to very different kind of approaches to lending and very different lending criteria that had uh, those that had applied in the past. There was a second aspect that was promoted by securitization, which is that if you write a contract for 20 or 25 years, and of course any loan, con certainly any residential mortgage has that uh, characteristic, and many other loans in the sector have that characteristic as well. If you make a contract for 20 or 25 years, there's an open question as to what part of the profit on that contract accrues in any particular year. And if you can create a market in these products and sell them, you can take a very, you can claim a very, to take a very large part of that overall profit on the activity up front, right at the beginning of the process. So that uh, the process of financialization and securitization leads to an ability uh, to approach profits in a short-term way and actually to accelerate the recognition of profits or actually believed profits because if, if it's the upfront profit on a 25-year contract, it's not the profit you actually make on that contract. It's the profit that you believe you're going to make on it that is relevant to the value you can sell it, or rather the profit you can persuade other people you're going to make on it that is relevant to the price at which you can sell it. So you get this acceleration of, uh, of profits. And that, roughly speaking, is what happened up to 2008. And we all know where it ended in 2008. And it didn't, uh, and right, and it didn't end well.
And not only did it not end well, but bluntly it didn't end in 2008. And although a lot of the, uh, the securitization that went on up to that particular period went out of fashion in the years that have followed, we've seen a gradual revival of what people in the financial sector think of as business as usual subsequently. So what we've seen in relation to this kind of part of the finance sector is something we've seen across the financial sector this process of financialization in which financial institutions trading with themselves have become an inward looking activity which is less and less related to the underlying needs of the savers whose money it is on the one hand or the people who are using the finance on the other. We have a finance sector which has grown up over 30, 40 years which is more and more divorced from the underlying needs of the non-financial economy. So is there an answer to that? Well, there is an answer and it's really not very difficult, which is to say that basically we did these things better 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we did them better with shorter, simple chains of intermediation in which capital was being allocated by people who were on the spot and people who had particular knowledge of the markets and the individuals and the businesses with whom the loans were being placed. And we actually eroded that knowledge in favor of people who had knowledge of the functioning of markets themselves. So the answer is a short, simple chain of intermediation in the residential property sector, where we go back to the rather boring world in which the truth is, um, I mentioned at the beginning that 3% of the assets of British banks uh, were loans to non-financial businesses. If you ask what the rest is, the story runs something like that. 80% of the assets of banks, and this for various accounting reasons is, if anything, an underestimated, 80% of the assets of banks are liabilities of other financial institutions and vice versa. That is, the balance sheets are overwhelmingly made up of intra-financial sector trading. But of the part that deals with the real non-financial economy, about two-thirds is residential mortgages. The main things banks actually do uh, for the, the real economy, although the non-financial economy, although this is not the impression you would get if you talk to people in banks, the main thing they do is the thing they always did, which is take deposit and lend the money out on mortgage. Uh, and that, as I say, accounts for about two thirds of it. And taking deposits and lending them out on mortgages by people who have, with some kind of technological assistance, knowledge of both housing and the people to them they're lending is the bedrock of that kind of banking system. Commercial property is actually essentially the ideal investment for the long-term pension funds, which are now uh, a growing part and becoming a dominant part of the institutional savings channels in Australia and New Zealand. I'm well aware of how large this has become here. Uh, and it's becoming similarly significant in Britain and in due course the United States. So that's the natural, knowledgeable investor in commercial property. That is a short, simple chain of intermediation in which there's a direct connection between the people who are providing the funds and the places in which mon the money is being in invested and the volume of activity which I was describing at the beginning of people in the financial sector trading with each other becomes essentially irrelevant to the process uh, uh, which I'm describing. Along with that, the process of financialization created large financial conglomerates that it used to be the case that we had effectively siloed activities in which banks were banks, and insurance companies were insurance companies, and asset managers were, were asset managers. Part of that exercise of financialization was that we dismantled the, the rules or the implicit uh, rules 
which stopped financial conglomerates coming into being, and we replaced them by rule books which attempted to control the behavior of these much larger institutions. The result is that the rule books have become ever more complicated year by year, and yet less effective in achieving the objectives of creating a financial sector that serves the needs of the underlying economy. What we need, I'm afraid, is largely to turn the clock back and to realize that we made an experiment in regulatory reform that, with hindsight, proves largely to have been a mistake. We need finance, but we need a simpler financial system, much better related to the needs of the kind of people who are gathered in this room today. Thank you very much.